It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And uh, you know, not early on in ministry, I was talking to uh, a pastor a friend of mine who was an elder of mine. Uh, he had been in the ministry. At that time, I'd probably been in the ministry less than five years, and he had been in the ministry probably 40 plus. And I asked him the secret. Um, I said, what's the secret to success in ministry? And uh, he said, well, that's simple. He said, you just need to love people and then love them some more and then love them some more. And then he said, when, when you think you've loved them all that you can, he said, then what do you, you know what you got to do? You got to love them some more. And so tonight I want to talk to you about the importance of love. You may have caught on that I often preach on this subject because I just think it's so important. Um, and so that's the title of the message tonight, The Importance of Love. I may give you this illustration before, but it's so funny that I'm going to read it to you again. Uh, it says, reaching the end of a job interview, the human resource person asked a young accountant who was fresh out of school, what starting salary were you thinking about? The accountant said, well, I was thinking in the neighborhood of 100 to 150,000 a year, depending, of course, on the benefit package. The interviewer sat straight up and said, well, what would you say to a package of five weeks of vacation, 17 paid sick days, in addition to every federally paid holiday, as well as including Valentine's Day, full medical and dental, company retirement fund to match 50% of your salary every year, a profit related pay and a company car leashed every two years. Of course, your choice, BMW, Mercedes, or, or Cadillac. Well, the accountant sat straight up, could hardly believe what he was hearing, and he said, wow, what a benefits package. Are you kidding? The interviewer replied, yes, but you started it. <laughs> so tonight, I want to talk to you a little bit about the benefits. I want to start out by talking about the benefits of love. And, uh, of course, when you're talking about love, you, you can't, um, you, you'd be remiss to, to miss out on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So I think they're going to put it up here. And it, I have no way of reading that, so I'll read it from my, my Bible here. Um, I bet you a few years ago I could have. All right, here we go. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and, and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. For love is patient, and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So Bob, you were saying, I, I know I've said this before in speaking to you, but it says people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And uh, tonight, I, I think that it is typified in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, those first few verses where it says, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that could move mountains, but I had not love, it says that we are nothing if it's without love. As a matter of fact, it says if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, that's, that's, a, that's quite a bit of an, uh, that's quite an act. But it says, but if we have nothing, if we have not love, we gain nothing. We, we see Jesus, and as he drew people to him, we see that um, he did the miracles and people came. They brought the sick, um, uh, that their friends or their loved ones may be made well. They, he came, they came and, and listened to his teachings and, and, and were rocked to the core by, by the parables that he presented. They listened to the words of prophecy that he said would, that, that for things that would come. We know that... that uh, that, that he drew a crowd. But my question to you tonight was, is this. What would have happened had all those things, all those miracles, all those teachings, all those words of prophecy, everything that he presented to the people, what would have happened had they been given without love? 
You see, people are drawn by the supernatural. Is that that's true? Amen? You agree with me? People are drawn by the supernatural. And, and they were drawn by, by the things that only he was doing. And nobody else had ever done. But they were delivered into relationship with him through his love. They came because they heard that he was doing miracles. They came because, because Grace, he was teaching. And, he, and his teachings rocked him to the core. But, but in the end, they came in relationship with him. They were drawn and they came to embrace his message. And the early church was birthed because of the love in which saturated everything that he did. We know that he came uh, motivated by love because of John 3.16. It says, for God so loved the world. That was his motivation. He came for that reason and that reason only. What would happen if we learned to love people because of their blemishes instead of despite them? Jesus, being drawn by love, came because of our blemishes, not despite them. That's what drew him here. Don, he came because, because we were messed up people. And he said, I love those people and I need to help them. He said, I'm going to go. I'm going to go because I love them enough to help them. If we could embrace the idea that all have sinned. Anybody in here hasn't sinned? I'm not raising my hand. Listen, I said the other day at Texas Roadhouse, I'm just going to confess before everybody, I had seven, seven of those rolls with the honey, with the cinnamon butter. Seven of them. I'd also like to tell you that Lucas had 10. Okay, so um, I've never seen it. At one point I told Lucas, I said, Lucas, you know you can just lick that butter out with your tongue. And he said, can I do that? I said, sure, but he did it. It's <laughs> awesome. It's awesome. Lucas, you made my day. But if we can embrace that all of us have sinned, that not one person in this room is greater than another, although, although those of us in this room have embraced the gift that Jesus gave to us that we may have life, we're no better than, than the next man that's out there. We're no better than our neighbor. For Jesus came because we all had sinned. True relationship, true relationship, whether it be between us and the Father or between each other, is impossible without the presence of love. For relationship demands love. Our desire should be that through relationship with us, that others may form relationship with Christ. That we would love them, and through that, they would love the one who loved all of us. I want to read to you verses 4 through 7 again. It says, love is patient, love is kind. It, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Man, that sounds so good. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Think with me tonight, what are the elements that, that we look for in a person when we want to have a relationship with them? What are the elements that we look for in a person? Patience, kindness, not having envy, not being boastful, not, not being proud, not, not distributing anger towards us or displaying rudeness or selfishness. Do we look for people who would protect us? Come on. People who would be trustworthy, people who would be hopeful that, that we, could, we could do more than we maybe even think we, we and ourselves can do. People who are relentless, who persevere in relationship towards us. If you think about it, this one element, love, this one thing in and of itself, by its nature, has the qualities that others desire to be in relationship with. If we just become, if we could just become people of love, as, as my pastor friend had told me, just love people and love them some more and love them some more. And when you don't think, when you think you've loved them as much as you can, he said, love them just a little more. If we could just begin to love one another and love the lost, love our Lord. 
All the qualities that draw people into relationship are encompassed in that. Because love, as described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, has all the things that people are looking for. We long to form relationships. Let's be honest. We long to form relationships. Nobody wants to be alone. I've never met anybody said, man, you know what? My lifetime pursuit is just to be lonely. Nobody wants that. We all long to form relationships. But we all struggle to make the sacrifice. The truth is we are simply one decision from having love as a mainstay in our lives. And it's that love has to be unconditional. As long as we put rules to our love, our ability to love will always be hampered. But if we'll begin to look at love as the avenue that God chose to use to connect with us as his people, if we'll understand that love was the avenue that God chose to use to connect with us, we too will be inspired to create and walk that path too. So that God can help us to create relationships with one another, and in turn, that we would create relationship with Him. So this evening, I want us to be inspired to love because of the example Christ set for us. He placed it at the top of His priority list. Why? Because only love could produce the results He desperately wanted. So it's not I want to give you three results, three results that that love produced, that only love could produce. Number one is this. Love, love broke the chains. Love broke the chains. Christ's love was shown when he chose to leave his father and come to earth to save mankind. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says this. It says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recover the sight of the blind, for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is Jesus speaking. It's in the red. It's in the red. You need to understand that in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, Jesus makes it very clear what he has come to earth to do. He's come to preach the good news, to proclaim freedom for the prisoner, to bring healing to the sick, to release, to release the oppressed. He came that his love would break the chains of mankind. Amen? Amen? Story goes, there was two young boys whose, whose dad was a police officer, and they, they got to mess with this extra pair of handcuffs. And they decided to handcuff each other, so they put one handcuff on one, one handcuff on the other, and they, that was fun for a while, and they were, they were playing with it, and they were dragging each other around, and then it was time to be done playing with it, and they looked at the same drawer, the nightstand, where they had gotten the handcuffs, but there was no key. So they began to try to get those things off and wiggle, the top. maybe we didn't put it too tight, we can wiggle our way out. No, that was no good. They began to look at every drawer they could think of. They were hurrying around trying before they got caught that they had, they had locked themselves in these handcuffs, but no such luck. No key to be found. So finally, they had to call their father and admit what they had done, that they had been playing and got themselves all chained up, all handcuffed. So he brings home the key and he releases the boys, of course, they get the talk. Not to be messing with things they shouldn't be messing with. But tonight, it wasn't that long ago that many of us got ourselves handcuffed. It's not that long ago that while we were handcuffed, maybe some of us even enjoyed it for a while. We didn't realize we were really that handcuffed. We didn't realize we were that constricted, you know? We, for a while, we were like, hey, this is fun! But there came a point where we wanted out. There came a point where we wanted the chain off. We came, there came a point where we decided, this isn't what I want anymore. But we couldn't get out. Oh, we tried, didn't we? We tried everything. We tried to wiggle out and try to find an escape and try to find something uh, within our own abilities that would, would help. We, we, but here's the problem. We lacked the key. We lacked the resource 
to set ourselves free. Handcuffed by our own sin, by our own choices. We stuck ourselves in there, but we couldn't get ourselves out. And eventually, thankfully, we realized there was only one option left. Pastor, there came that moment in your life, there came that moment in my life, where we called the Father. We got down on our knees at an altar. We got down on our knees beside the bed. We got on our knees or knelt our head with a friend. I don't know what it was for you, but you called the Father. And in that moment, He set us free. In that moment, just like that, just like the Father who was a policeman, He set His sons free from the handcuffs. So too does our Heavenly Father because He loves us. Waits to Waiting for us to call upon him. And he set us free. Because he loved us enough to come where we are. He came and got us. The truth is, young, young people. The truth is, adults. If you're bound today. If you're struggling today. You've tried everything else, and in your own ability, you can't get yourself free. He can do in two seconds what we can't do in a lifetime. See, those young, those young boys that struggle all day, they weren't ever going to get free. The Father could set them free like that. If we're honest with ourselves, we've got friends who are bound. We have family members who are bound. We have neighbors who are bound. There's not a person in this room tonight, if you, if you just thought for just a second, you can't think of, that you couldn't think of somebody you know who's in the handcuffs of sin tonight. And you know it's true. They're, they're trying as hard as they can to get themselves out of it. They're trying hard to try to figure out a way. Or maybe they're in the midst of enjoying it right now. They don't know yet. They don't know. They're stuck. We're surrounded by people here at Noble and the surrounding community who are bound and oppressed. But because Jesus chose to love first, he can set the captive free. He can break the chains. The reason Christ's love is so important is because it enables the captive to be set free. What could God do through us if we allow love to be our first emotion in our lives. If we allow love to motivate and to differentiate the decisions that we make day to day. The second result of Christ's love was this, that only love could create the way. Love created the way. John 14, 6 says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And brave, no one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Isn't that right? It's tough being the pastor's son. In the Old Testament, we all know that a lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the people. But in John 3.16, as we referenced earlier, the Bible, the Bible says that God was driven by love and gave His own Son that we would have a way to be saved. His motives were clear. Because in John 3, 17, it says that he came not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He came to create a way. Romans 5, 8 says, even though we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me rephrase that. Even though we ignored his instruction, even though we mocked his way and we did our own thing, Jesus died for us. Why? 
Because his only motive was love. Only through love could he be the way. And I challenge you tonight, only through unconditional love can we be used of God to provide direction for others to the way. Invited people to church before and they said, I don't want to go to church with people who are mean. I said, what church are we going to? I said, well, I'm just saying the last church I went to, they, they didn't smile at all. I said, well, I promise we'll smile. I said, I don't know. I don't know. And we laugh about, we laugh about that, but the truth is, is, is often we have people who it's hard to reach them because their encounter with people who said they are followers of Christ, the first thing they felt was not love. What happens in this building may draw them. They may say, man, I gotta go check that out. I heard that, I heard that Pastor Steve Lance. I heard he breaks it down. I heard he tells funny stories. I heard he asks his wife from the pulpit, do you tithe or your gross or net? <laughs> My side hurt. I was laughing so hard. I said, oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> They'll come because of, man, they want to check us out, but they will stay because they feel the love of God's people. We've got to get to the point. I, and I'm working on it, too. I've got to get to the point where my love is unconditional. I don't have the rules. Well, oh, God, I know you want to reach people, but there's a couple stipulations. How I many of you know the world's not getting easier to love? They're not getting less combative. They're not getting less confrontational. They're not necessarily having a love fest with the church either. And yet that's still not an excuse. As we talked about, Romans 5 a, Even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. And even though we are surrounded by sinful people doing sinful things, with some very hateful intentions, if we will lead with love, Scripture says love never fails. Challenge us that through our unconditional love that we can be used by God to provide direction for others to the way. Thirdly, the third result that only love can create is this, that love produced intimacy with His creation. You see, God wants more than a casual relationship with you. You know, those ones where, you know, that's that guy that you maybe works in your building. You don't even know his name. You just wave to him. Everything. That's not what God wants. That doesn't want kind of a flyby, you know. That doesn't want a once a week or twice a month or three times a year conversation. He wants to talk with us day by day. Let me just real quickly put a plug in. Building's open at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock every morning. A group of believers meeting up here and praying. Faithfully opening the building. Challenging. If you can fit within your schedule. If you can make a way, come up here. You'll be, you'll be encouraged. They pray with one another. They get alone and pray with the Lord. God wants, God wants us to have intimacy with Him. I've said this many times before, you probably figured this out by now, but other than my wife and my kids, my dad's called my best friend. We're very, very close. We talk every day, sometimes multiple times a day. Sometimes I think he's dodging my calls. Will you be praying about that? We see each other every week, and uh, most of the time, I'm uh, trying to convince him to come help me with some project. Once again, that may be the reason for the dodging of the calls. But we see, we, we talk every day, we see each other every week. He, and you know, the thing I know about my dad is that he wants me to succeed. I like hanging out with him. He's one of my best friends because he invests his time and his energy and his love in me. 
And so, why wouldn't I want to hang out with you? Do you have somebody like that? You love hanging out with? Nobody does. Nobody wants to hang out with Okay. It's like, no, I don't have anybody. Can I? Okay, you come hang out with my dad. All right. I'll share you. Jeremiah 29 11, Pastor used it this morning. We use it a lot, but, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll use it again tonight. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Our, our Father tells us exactly what He thinks of us. He didn't say, You know, my, my, my thoughts, my plans is that we kind of get to know each other. No, He says, I have plans for you. Not for, not for you to have a disastrous result, but that you would have a hope and a future. How many of you know that, that God's plan is so intricate that it can't be carried out with an occasional conversation? It can't be carried out with a casual, casual encounter. Brother Ben, could you imagine trying to carry out the call that God placed upon your life as a missionary in Africa, talking to him just every once in a while? There's no way. I, I know because I've heard the many stories and because I've, uh, uh, I've spent some time with Brother Ben listening and, and knowing the legacy that he, he laid there in Africa. Can I tell you something? It, he'll be the first one to tell you it's not because... He's the greatest of mankind. That the success began not in front of a multitude of people, but on his, on his face before the Lord in the morning. When you're in Africa, you don't walk outside. You don't start the day because you never know what you're going to encounter until you've got the covering of the Lord. Isn't that true, Brother Ben? Amen. Well, let me tell you something. Same should go for all of us. Don't start your day. Don't get out there in the middle of the encounter of, of co-workers, loved ones, and friends, maybe a few enemies, until you've been covered in the presence of the Lord with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. God's love created and produced an intimacy that we could have with Him. No longer do we need a middle man The old covenant required that a priest would make sacrifice for your sins. But when Christ died on the cross, you and I, none of us in this room, no longer did we need a middleman. Jesus created a new covenant, one in which we can be in his presence and talk to him. Listen to me face to face. You don't need Pastor Steve. You don't need Pastor Phil to, to mediate for you. Every one of you can go into the, the war room. I mean, you see the movie. Uh, every one of you can go into the prayer closet and meet God face to face just as intimate as Pastor and I can. Jesus knew the only way to be intimate with his creation was to be the sacrifice, to be the lamb, and to begin a new covenant. That plan could only be completed if it was driven by love. 1 John 4.19 says, We love because He first loved us. His love, His love created an example of intimacy in relationship, walking day by day, side by side. It created an example of that that we should strive to emulate with one another, to begin to say, you know what, I'm going to as the scripture says, as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. Let me challenge you tonight, this evening in my notes, but let me challenge you tonight. Do not walk the path of salvation by yourself. Do not walk this by yourself. Men, find other men that will sharpen you and challenge you and keep you accountable. Women, find other women that will sharpen you and challenge you and keep you accountable. That will lift you up. For when some are weak, others are strong. When others are weak, others will be strong. You will lift one another up. I close with this thought tonight. 
Mankind asked Jesus, how much do you love me? And Jesus spread his arms on a cross and answered this much. This much. And in that one beautiful exchange, Christ, driven by love, he gave his life so that you could, so that he could break the chains, become the way, and bring intimacy between him and all of mankind. I challenge you tonight, will you allow God's example to bring you to a whole new level of commitment to love? Will you allow God's example of how he loved to challenge you to love in a deeper way than you ever have before? Will you embrace your role of creating relationships with people who don't have one with God? Sometimes it takes a relationship with a believer before somebody will have a relationship with the Savior. They want to see what it, it looks like in flesh form. They want to, sometimes it takes the love of another human being to set them on course to the path to feel and experience the love of the Savior. Are you in this room tonight and you have chains that need to be broken? Because God and His love has already created a way for the chains to be broken. Do you need to find a way again? Do you need to find your way back? Because God's love created the way. And lastly, do you need to become more intimate with God. Maybe it's been sporadic, but God's love created a way for you to become intimate day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, with the creator of the universe, the one who breathed life into you. In that moment when Jesus laid his life upon a cross, there was a beautiful exchange. He gave his life so that your chains could be broken. He gave his life so that you could feel the love of a father intimately. He gave his life so that there would be a way. Tonight I'm going to ask, as the music plays, would you find a place around the altar? And here's what I'm asking you to pray. I'm getting real specific tonight. I want you to be down here tonight and either be praying, God, help me to love like I've never loved before. To be honest, that's why I'm at. Sometimes I get aggravated at people. I'm just being honest. And I want to be able to live that advice that my friend gave me. Love people and love people and love people. And you think you've loved them all you can, love them some more. I want to ask you, would you ask God to help you to love like never before? If you've got some chains that need to be broken, then tonight's the night to say, Father, would you release the chains? Would you break the chains? If you need to come back to Him, tonight's the night because He created the way. And maybe tonight's the night you say, God, this is a new year. And I'm going to dedicate every morning, I'm going to dedicate every day a time to get in the place where it's just you and I. Because I want to walk with you day by day. I don't want to do this walk by myself.